Well, as we've seen a huge week in American politics, we've had the Democrats in Chicago at their national convention. They wrapped up today. I watched most of Kamala, Kamala Harris's speech. Throughout the week, we've seen the likes of President Joe Biden, Barack and Michelle Obama, Bill and Hillary Clinton, even had Oprah Winfrey take to the stage. But today, it was all about Kamala Harris. For more, I'm joined now by the Australian's Washington correspondent who's travelled to Chicago, Adam Crichton. Adam, what did you make of all the hoopla? Was it as uh, exciting and as dynamic as it looked from a distance? Uh, yeah, look, it was a very slick operation. I think Democrats would be very happy with it, I must say. I mean, it wasn't as exciting, at least for me, as the Republican convention a few weeks ago, uh, which, of course, happened in the wake of the near assassination of Donald Trump. But uh, nevertheless, it was, uh, you know, it was very smooth, lots of good speeches. And I would have to say, Kamala Harris's speech was pretty good, I thought, tonight. I mean, it's hard to fault uh, kind of on a, a rhetorical level. She delivered it well. It was a good length, about 40 minutes, certainly much less than the 90 minutes that uh, the, the Trump droned on for it is. So journalists were grateful that they could get home before midnight. Uh, and, you know, she hit all the right notes. I mean, yeah, the criticism I would have is that there, you know, there's very little policy in the Democratic Party platform. And I thought she may have released something in the speech, but she didn't. Uh, she, you know, she stuck to the very... A uh, well-trod path for Democrats of talking about uh, the lack of abortion rights in the U.S. and the supposed assault on women by the Republican Party. Uh, she talked a bit about housing. Um, you know, she threw a bone to the left of the party, the left of the Democrat Party on Israel. She called for a ceasefire now, immediate ceasefire, and she dwelt a little on the devastation in Gaza. Um, I mean, that's unlikely to satisfy the left of the party, but at least it was something. But really, the speech was was a more of the same, but 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 with a much fresher, younger face. Um, you know, she clearly looked very happy. Uh, she spoke well. She looked good. I, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's hard to fault from you know from a political theatrics perspective. Seeing Oprah there, you just wonder why they didn't choose her. I mean, she'd win in a canter. But uh, look, you've been in the US for a while, a while now. Um, I said at the, the top of the show that as an Australian watching it in an Australian context back here, you do feel a bit cringeworthy with, well, they always go back to, you know, we lived in a small house, mum had to rent, you know, we were in a little neighbourhood with firemen, yes. so she could mention firemen and then police officers and mowing the lawn. I um, mean, you got all that stuff. Does that, does that sell well in the heartland of America where this election, Adam, is actually going to be fought? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a good point. And I was thinking the same thing today, actually, because I think she said, or, or at least someone said, that she had a working-class background, which is pretty ridiculous. I mean, her father is a professor of economics at Stanford, which is extremely elite, and her mother is a, was an Indian scientist. And don't quote me on this, but I think Brahmin caste Indian, which is not a low-class position in India. So, and, and, you know, she went to good schools and things. So, I mean, I think the notion that she's working-class is, is somewhat ridiculous. Um, you know, you'd certainly say middle class, but she, she but but certainly the speech dwelt a lot on that. Um, I mean, I don't really see anything in her upbringing that was, you know, particularly, you know, particularly bad or anything or any great kind of adversity that she faced. But you know, maybe people will buy it, and and certainly, you know, compared to Donald Trump, there's no question she, you know, she had a harder upbringing compared to that. Um, but uh, yeah, look, it's all about the vibe. It's all about abstract nouns, freedom and joy. I mean, you know, we saw with Obama, he had, uh, you know, he had hope and change in 2008, and that worked for him. You know, he got eight years in the White House. Well, this time it's freedom and joy. So let's see if that works for Harris. Yeah, if you want to talk about a tough upbringing, read J.D. Vance's book, as I know you have, and so have I, and that's what you talk about being a tough upbringing. I mean, she's got to lay off that stuff a bit. I was a bit intrigued where she started talking about housing and said that, oh, well, we're going to fix America's housing crisis. Hasn't she been vice president for the last three and a half years? Yeah, look, it's worth pointing out, I mean... Uh, the level of house price appreciation in the US has been extraordinary in the last three, four years. I think 30 something percent in just that short period of time. And so a lot of them angry, a lot of Americans are very angry about that, as you can imagine. Uh, the average house price, median house price rather, has gone up to something like 500,000 US dollars, which is a lot of money for the typical American. And of course, that's that's been the result of you know the hundreds of billions of uh, new dollars that have been injected into the economy by the Biden administration, which, of course, as you say, she's part of. I mean, the whole inflationary experience that has been so damaging 
to ordinary people in this country uh, was really the result in large part of her administration. And I think Americans would, you know, would observe Joe Biden and they probably thought that for a vice president, she probably had a greater role in those policies than, than most vice presidents would have, given, you know, given his obvious cognitive decline. So the challenge for the party is to try to separate her from that. And, uh, you know, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to blame inflation on big, greedy corporations. And that's why they've introduced this so-called price gouging policy, uh, which is a bit of a thought bubble, really. And, you know, of course, will never happen. Uh, so they've tried to blame others on that. Um, there's very little substance to the campaign. I mean, it's really, you know, more of the same and we're not Donald Trump. That's pretty much it. Uh, anything to read into the fact Joe Biden wasn't there? Well, I know his staff posted a pic of, of him looking at the debate, <laughs> saying that he can't wait to watch it, although I think that's that's probably false uh, because, I mean, he'd obviously be very upset about the whole episode. Uh, but, look, I mean, of course, he spoke on the first night, but, I mean, his prominence at the four-day uh, convention was basically zero by today. I mean, he was hardly mentioned at all. I mean, of course, Kamala Harris mentioned him very fleetingly at the start. You know, she had to really morally, of course. Uh, because she, you know, because he has created her. I mean, remember, she, you know, she did really badly in 2019 when she herself ran for president. She didn't win a single state. It dropped out very early. And all this is a complete result of the fact that that uh, that he chose her for vice president. And now she's, you know, she's in this position and, and she could well be the president in a few months. Sitting there in Chicago, when you look at the polls, what does your experience tell you, Adam, about how accurate they are and or are they going to change radically between now and polling day? The average of most uh, reputable national polls is she's on 47, Trump's on 43-something. So about three percentage points. Uh, that's, that's pretty close. I mean, I think we'll have a better read on the outlook actually tomorrow when um, uh, when Robert F. Kennedy gives his big press conference where the rumour is that he's going to drop out and back Donald Trump. Now, now, the interesting question there is, is he going to campaign with Donald Trump? And I think if he does campaign with Donald Trump, uh, then that's a big problem for the Democrats because he has, although it's small, he has about five percentage points of support. And if three or four of those went to Trump, that would be a big problem for Democrats. Just finally, speaking of Donald Trump, we know the, that he watched the conve convention. His reaction was a little bit like mine. Why didn't Kamala do more when she was in the White House? Have a quick listen to what he had to say after. All of these things that she talked about, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do everything, but she didn't do any of it. She could have done it three and a half years ago. She could do it tonight. She didn't talk about China. She didn't talk about fracking. She didn't talk about crime. Look, she's a Marxist. She always was. She always will be. So obviously the mainstream media are going to report it differently. What was your interpretation on what Donald said after? Well, look, I mean, I think he's right to make the political point that, uh, you know, that she's been part of this administration. Um, you know, so why hasn't she done these things already? I think it's a very, you know, very fair point. I think, you know, her next big test is obviously going to be the first press conference she gives. You know, she's she's been in this position now for four weeks or so, and she hasn't given one. She hasn't given one sit down interview. Uh, that's going to be difficult. But she has reversed. You know, she has reversed her positions on all those crucial issues that that Trump just said, and he and she's going to have to explain that. Uh, which is going to be difficult, especially on fracking, because she was diametrically opposed to it. And the state of Pennsylvania is heavily dependent on fracking, and she needs to win that state. Uh, so she's going to have to have a very good answer for that, uh, you know, for that 180 she's taken. Look forward to seeing your coverage in the uh, Weekend Australian tomorrow, Adam Crichton. Thanks a lot for joining us from Chicago. Thanks very much, Steve. Bye-bye.